Inga mana inga reo inga reo ranga tirama te nei te mihi atu ki a koutou. Nga mihi aroha ki a koe a whai a tariana o te rapi e kua wehi ia. Te whai o te motu e ai ki a hami te whai o te au pākeha hoki. Nga mihi aroha ki a koe tā meihana te i rangatira o te ao rangahau i pāna ki te ao Māori e tōho rangatira hoki, ngā mihi aroha ki a kōrua, ngā mihi hoki ki a koe matua, whatarangi, me ngā tangata kua huhi mai i tēnei rā, hei kautoko i te kaupapa hirahira, te whānau oranga ngā mihi ki a koutou. Ko ai au, he uri tēnei nō ngā titipa, ngā tikino haku me te ao pauri, nō reira tēnā rā tātou katoa. So, I was a bit shocked when I looked on the programme and saw that I was a keynote. So, in my mind, I've reorganised the agenda and made Cathy Irwin the keynote for the afternoon, and I'm her younger chaser. Beautiful kōrero, I really enjoyed that, Cathy. So I'm a bit of a, a data geek, and um, a data geek that doesn't have a pointer, hang on. Here we go. So today I'm going to talk about data, but data is something I'm really passionate about, and it's something I think is absolutely vital for the kaupapa that we're here today to support, which is Fano Order. This one. There we go. I would lose all my street cred talking about data if I didn't know how to work this. <laughs> So, um, data are everywhere. We live in an age where data are everywhere. And the volume of data is growing at an exponential rate. Healthcare data in the digital universe alone doubled in the last two years. The number of human genome scans doubled in the last seven months or so. Some of this data in this vast data ecosystem, we create ourselves in real time via smartphones and Fitbits and other devices. Fitbits can measure how many steps we take, how long we sleep for, the quality of our sleep and our heart rate. But there's no patient doctor privacy. And uploading this data and collecting your own health data is basically like putting your, publishing your medical autobiography online. We now live in an internet of things we everything from fridges to phones to buildings to drones can collect the data and sometimes can share the data between these devices. We live in a world where the first thing that many people do when they get up first thing in the morning is reach for their phone and open Facebook and like something. Facebook, which has 1.8 billion users, which is roughly the same as about half of the world's adult population. And what we like on Facebook reveals a lot about our personal tastes and preferences. And this information is big money for companies increasingly who use the social media data, combine it with other forms of data, and build very detailed profiles, um, which they can then pass on to their clients to target us in highly individualized ways, often without us knowing to influence our behaviors in terms of our consumption patterns and who we, and, as we're seeing to devastating effect in the last US election, who we vote for come election time. Uh, we live in a world where data that once only existed in dusty boxes in the corner of museums are now being brought out and digitized and made widely available, including data that includes our traditional knowledge and our stories about ourselves. The capacity to link and use and reuse and integrate and analyze data from different sources for different purposes has also expanded rapidly. And in most instances, there is no explicit permission sought to enable these data linkages and analysis to occur. So whether we participate consciously or unconsciously in this vast and rapidly expanding data ecosystem, we as individuals, as Fano, as hapu, as iwi, as indigenous peoples are part of the data revolution, whether we like it or not. Now I'm a demographer and there's nothing a demographer loves more than data, and lots of it, census data, survey data, vital data, admin data, 
unit record data, group data, population data, time series data, panel data, synthetic data, linked up, real-time, integrated, open, shared, visualized, pumped out, popped out, free data. We're all about the data. Now, as someone who routinely works with data to inform and to influence, I know how powerful data can be. And powerful people have long known the power of the data. The word census derives from the Latin word sincere, which means to tax or assess. And its origins of the census in antiquity coincide with the rise of early Chinese and Roman and Egyptian states and their extraction of resources from the population, whether to tax or to provide labor or for military conscription. In the 18th and 19th centuries, learned men, and they nearly always were men, called on the science of statistics to investigate the linkages between societal conditions and health, and to identify precision-like laws about society which were akin to, akin to Newtonian mechanics, if you like. And the focus of these statistical investigations were often the working poor, and the goal was to monitor and control. It goes without saying that we as indigenous peoples have had very fraught experiences with data collections controlled by the state. I have spent countless hours looking at historical census volumes on iwi which were collected by colonial officials. And it's very clear that iwi were the, and hapu were the objects of surveillance and that the motivation for census taking was largely one in pursuit of assimilation, domination, and then later economic incorporation. In more recent times, data about Māori, including whānau Māori, have been used to identify gaps, explain gaps, close gaps, plug gaps, deny gaps, attribute blame for gaps, and prescribe solutions for gaps. But more often than not, the requirements and the priorities of government have taken precedence over Māori and Fano and iwi informational needs and priorities. So what do we as Māori have to gain from recent innovations in data gathering, storing, linking, sharing, and analysis of our data? There are many claims at the moment being made about the value of the data, but what is the value to us? The Prime Minister is a passionate champion of the social investment approach to social spending. He hopes that greater data sharing and the use and reuse of data will direct resources to the right people in the right way at the right time. In short, to get better bang for buck. This vision is accompanied by a push to remove the barriers to data sharing and use across government, as well as with NGOs and the private sector. And many of you in NGOs will know this already in terms of your client level data. The Data Futures Partnership, which might, some of you may have heard about, is on a mission to unlock the economic and social value of data across New Zealand's data ecosystem. Even Statistics New Zealand, once the bastion of data gatekeeping, and I've been told it was one of the hardest places in the world in terms of national statistics offices to get data from, now has a new mantra, which is to unleash the power of the data to change lives. That's a big claim. But hyperbole aside, these are in some ways laudable goals and that they represent a sea change in thinking about the relationship between data and citizenship and public good and state-funded services. But from a Māori perspective, one is compelled to ask who is doing the unleashing and the unlocking, on whom, for what purpose, and according to whose values. We should, I think, be concerned by the uncritical and somewhat blind faith and the capability of data and data experts to provide access to a higher order truth and evidence. Data points are not self-evident facts, and I've looked at a lot of data. Data points are not self-evident facts, but they reflect the social, the political, and the cultural context in which the data are analyzed and collected and interpreted. Um, one of my colleagues, Aboriginal social scientist Maggie Walter, has written at length about the multiple ways in which data misspeak can occur, especially when the focus is on identifying subpopulations for the purpose of intervening. All too often, as Māori, we have found ourselves as a problem to be solved, the ones to be intervened upon. And the data narratives 
told about us, all too often, are data narratives about failure, and I think we've heard about that this morning. And this can happen even in the absence of explicit ethnical racial profiling. To be sure, there are data innovations that have some pearl of wisdom, some pearl of potential, and they have massive potential to impact on our lives, but these changes are occurring rapidly, and they are occurring without meaningful participation, protection, and partnership. Take, for example, the Integrated Data Infrastructure, the IDI, which sits at the heart of the Census Transformation Programme. Most Māori, indeed most New Zealanders, are unaware that their data are being linked across administrative data sets. And unlike the Nordic countries and other European countries where they've had hundreds of years of experience of population registers, here in Aotearoa we do not have a unique cradle to grave number or identifier that follows us from birth to death. We don't have that. And so more creative statistical solutions have to be found. And the average member of the public of our whanau has no awareness of this. Trust, I think, once lost, is very, very difficult to gain, particularly for Indigenous peoples and particularly when it comes to data. And the, um, our neighbours across the ditch, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, they learnt this very recently when the media revealed that it would retain the names and addresses it collected as part of the 2016 census. And this move ignited widespread public uh, debate and protest. But the data in this IDI, in the Integrated Data Infrastructure, that are linked up from all these different data sets, including tax, benefits, corrections, or a whole bunch of government agencies, these are anonymised and they're not intended for operational purposes. They are linked and accessed within a five safe framework that Stats New Zealand does carefully observe under the mantle of the independence of the government statistician and the Statistics Act. This is distinct from other data linkage that is occurring within and across government which is not anonymised and which is being mined for operational purposes such as predictive risk profiling and targeted services and we all know who the targets of those services are. One of our earlier speakers said everyone wants data to turn, to turn numbers into names. And you're right on the button there. Everyone wants data to turn numbers into names. I find it absolutely unacceptable that initiatives such as these are occurring in the absence of a robust Māori data governance partnership that is representative, that is enabling, that offers protection to us, that provides clear line of sight and accountability back to iwi and back to Māori. Without these sorts of mechanisms, there's a grave risk that the data revolution will harm us more than it will help us. It runs the risk of government being something that is done to people rather than by people. And it runs, I think, the risk of replicating, albeit in a far more sophisticated way, colonial systems of population surveillance that have only served in the past to disempower us as Māori. So I suppose the question is one thing to offer a critique, it's another thing to try and move forward from that. So what might be the basis for a proper relationship between Māori and the Crown and our other partners with respect to data? For Te Manarā and I'm not talking on behalf of Te Manarā I'm just here as Taku Kukutai, who happens to be a member of Te Manarā which is the Māori Data Sovereignty Network that I'm really proud to be a part of. The answer lies in um, enabling Indigenous data sovereignty. So the concept of data sovereignty is global and it's really about data jurisdiction. That a nation's laws apply to digital information residing within its national internet infrastructure. That's data sovereignty. And it's really the product of a digital age in cloud-based computing where data are virtual and dynamic and potentially stateless and it's almost impossible to provide a definition of domestic data. The concept of indigenous data sovereignty inverts that relationship so that data are subject to the laws of the nation from which the data are collected, and that includes indigenous nations. And a really good definition comes from our colleagues at the United States Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, based at the Native Nations Institute in the University of Arizona, that data, indigenous data sovereignty, is the rights of a nation to govern the collection, ownership, and application of its own data. And Aotearoa Tamanara Ranga has defined Māori data sovereignty as the right of Māori to access, 
to use to have governance and control over Māori data. Sovereignty over data is not an end in itself, but rather it's a means, it's a pathway, it's a mechanism for supporting the realisation of Māori and iwi and hapu and whānau aspirations and for enabling self-determination and innovation. The question, of course, is always a tricky one. Well, what do you mean by Māori data? There's no such thing as Māori data. Of course there's such a thing as Māori data. Māori data is actually pretty clear. It's data from Māori that's self-generated, so that'll be iwi data, Māori organisational data, business data. We had a great uh, quarter this morning about what's happening with whānau tahi and the really creative use of some of that transactional data to inform decision-making and, um, and provide robust evidence within the control of Māori organisations. So that's one aspect of Māori data. But actually, the vast majority of the data about us does not sit within our direct control. There's a lot of data that's been amassed over decades, over centuries, that sits beyond our direct control. And that's data about us that's generated by others, and it's used to describe or compare us. Often we have little participation or input into the narratives that come from those data. And then, of course, there's data about resources, because it's not just about people, it's also about place. It's not just about whakapapa, it's also about whenua and awa and our other resources that we cherish. So Māori data also includes data about resources, whether that comes from ourselves or whether it comes from third parties. One of the criticisms might be that, well, actually, we're just talking about digital data now, and so really Māori have no claim on digital data, and we kind of know about some of those arguments. But while the concept of data sovereignty is kind of the product of a digital age, the concept of having collective control over data is not a new concept at all. Indigenous peoples, including Māori, have long been data gatherers. We have long had our own rights and responsibilities and rules over how we handle this collective knowledge, whether it's in whakapapa, whether it's in genealogies, whether it's in carving, songs, chants and ceremony. That was all data. It just looks different these days. Knowledge belonged to the collective, not to the individual. It wasn't the individual's knowledge to give away. And it was fundamental to collective identity. It did play an important role. So indigenous data sovereignty is in many ways about moving from a state of data dependency back to a state of, or position of autonomy and control. So the concept of indigenous data sovereignty is grounded, is fundamentally based in our inherent rights to self-determination, which we know are recognised through the Treaty of Waitangi and also in international human rights instruments such as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, last week I was really fortunate to be a speaker at a masterclass on Indigenous data sovereignty that was hosted by the Australian Indigenous Governance Institute. Um, and the participants, which included a really diverse range of community leaders, of data geeks, of IT people, of analysts, planners and decision makers, they were asked to write down in one single word what Indigenous data sovereignty meant to them, and this is what was captured. Oops. <coughs> Bagger, I mixed up my slides. <laughs> okay, just pretend you didn't see it there. Okay, here we go. So this is what was captured in their corridor. This is a word cloud, and the key notions there were empowerment and control and self-determination and well-being. These are the things that actually lie at the heart of Indigenous data sovereignty. It's not regression, it's not algorithms, it's not accuracy, it's these other things that data sovereignty enables. And Cathy talked about the importance of nation building. And I wish I had another slide, although I'd probably mess it up if I put another one in there. But there was a really great corridor given by the US colleagues about the importance of data for nation rebuilding um, and how data sovereignty lies at the heart of nation rebuilding for American Indian First Nations tribes. In, um, in my own backyard in Ngāti Tipa, this sounds like it's all very high level, but it actually plays out in the grassroots in different ways. I was just talking to some of my Ngāti Tipa whanaunga before about some of the plans we have to build our own population database for Ngāti Tipa. We're not recognised on the Stats New Zealand list of official even iwi, even though my tūpuna Kukutai signed the treaty, his son Ngā Pakakutai signed the treaty, and we had our own mana whenua over our rohe. And so our plan um, is to build our own population database, to reconstitute our own tūpuna and our own whenua, put together whakapapa and whenua, and that we will have control over. And so this will link us to the past, it will ground us in the present, and it will guide us into the future, and it will be ours. 
if the people say they want it. <laughs> There'll be lots of wānanga. So, I'm getting to the end. In Aotearoa, and now I'm going to have to go back, there's an increasing call, and some of this call might have come from you, to put Māori data in Māori hands. This requires more than a widget so that we can track our personal health data across the health system. This requires more than one-on-one -on -one selective consultation to give some iwi customised data and not give it to others. This requires power sharing, genuine power sharing. So much of the data about Māori, about Māori resources, are not held by us, they're not even accessible to us. At a practical level, it requires having a really robust data governance principles and mechanisms that can provide transparency, accountability, build trust, and provide a clear pathway to benefit. So if we think about the, the data ecosystem that I showed in that first slide, which is really huge and covers all sorts of data from Facebook likes to drones to government data to health data, there's spaces such as social media the Facebook like, where we as Māori and as communities and whānau have pretty much no control over what that looks like. At the other end of the spectrum, there's Māori data that's generated by us, like tribal registers, where we almost have complete control over that data and what it looks like. In the middle is a whole range of data about us, sometimes for us, but definitely not designed by us, where there's a huge amount of opportunity, because this is not just about risk, it's also about opportunity. Data is opportunity. And some of that opportunity has to be realised through data governance, it has to be realised through ownership, and it has to be realised through us actively participating and co-designing the system. So, um, I should come to the end now, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about outside of Aotearoa. If we look over to Canada, for example, they're the drive for Indigenous data sovereignty, because this is not just a thing in Aotearoa, this is a thing that's emerging and emerging rapidly in other countries as well with other, indi other Indigenous peoples. And in Canada, this idea of Indigenous data sovereignty has been around for quite some time, and it's found tangible expression in the OCAP principles, O-C-A-P, which are developed and promoted by the First Nations Information Governance Centre. I wish I had a slide, there's a great OCAP slide, but I, I don't have it. But these data principles of OCAP, they stand for ownership, control, access and possession. And these OCAP principles, they recognise explicitly community rights and interests in their information. OCAP ensures that First Nations communities own their information and it respects the fact that they are stewards of their information, much in the same way that they're stewards over their land and resources. <coughs> OCAP's now become the de facto ethical standard for conducting research in First Nations communities and also for the collection and the handling and the management and the analysis of First Nations information in general. So in Aotearoa, the governments began uh, in the last year or so to review the information management policy and the legislative framework as part of a move towards this broader information sharing and data use and data reuse. And this includes reviews of the Statistics Act and it also includes reviews of the Privacy Act. It is likely that there will be a very strong focus on individual rights to confidentiality and privacy. But what about collective rights and interests? What about whānau, hapu and iwi rights? Communal rights are complex and they're very poorly understood within a liberalised Western framework of individual privacy. If we are, I think, to have a fit-for-purpose data ecosystem, one that is truly inclusive, truly ethical, truly trustworthy, truly valuable and truly beneficial, the rights and interests of us as Māori needs to be firmly accounted for within such a system. And this will be best achieved, I think, through a deliberative partnership rather than ad hoc consultation, which is currently how it's, how it's uh, been rolled out. So the last slide I want to talk about is this iti framework, ahakoihi uh, iti namu. And this framework came from uh, Kiri Kofai Mikaire, who's one of my colleagues in uh, Te Manara Raunga. She's fabulous, some of you may know her from Wanganui. And she's really been at the forefront of developing some of this thinking around, well, how do you give practical expression to data sovereignty? Because she has to work with iwi on a daily basis and she has to be accountable and translate what might seem like abstract concepts into real stuff of how it works on the ground. And so she developed this framework of iti, which is information, translators and infrastructure. 
Um, and it's really a simple but kind of effective way of thinking about how data sovereignty might be realised in a practical sense. We all know, and we've talked about, various speakers have talked about this today, and yesterday I gather as well, although I wasn't here, about that having the right information is absolutely critical. We know that our information needs are really at the centre of decision making. There's been some improvements, but we very rarely are our informational needs at the centre of decision making, but it needs to be. So if data are going to be used to tell a story about us, we need to have the right data, and that includes culture smart data, and that need data also needs to be analysed with a culture smart lens, a lens that reflects our values and priorities. Being, for the, when it comes to large data sets and big data, being a statistical whiz, yeah, that might be necessary, but it's nowhere near sufficient. We need the right lens on the data to tell the stories that are meaningful. Enough with the deficit stories about how sad and bad and mad we are. We need to flip and we need to widen the lens, and this is where data governance becomes really essential. Uh, the second part is translators. Having data translators, I hear that little Manu tweeting over there, so I'm going to wrap it up. Having data translators, um, where I come from, it's a cowbell. I'm really glad nobody kind of imported that into this conference. It would be really distracting. <laughs> but I can, I can handle the Manu. Um, and having data translators is also a really key part of making data work for us. And this means we need to train and mentor data warriors at the grassroots, within our whānau, within our communities, within our organisations. We've had no problem uh, producing lawyers uh, in the last 20 years, we need some data people. This is the new, this is the new century. This is what we're, we're part of. And we need to start trading these, uh, treating these data capabilities as absolutely, absolutely essential to how we operate. And finally, we need some investment in the right data infrastructure. Infrastructure that's both hard and soft to incorporate and to, to kind of capture, if you like, all aspects of that data value chain that I showed in my, in my first slide. And this might include everything, not just demographers, although we need a few more. Um, systems architects, people who can design widgets, EWI data warehouses. I mean, most of our data is sitting on a cloud in some warehouse in Texas. Why don't we have an EWI data warehouse? And maybe a centralised Māori information bureau that can pull the data out from government into a centralised space that has clear lines of sight and accountability back to iwi, back to Māori organisations, back to te ao Māori. Um, so one last thing I want to... Last uh, slide. Oops, I forgot my animations. That's basically what I just said. So the last one is just basically a shameless plug because sometimes that kumara is sweet. <laughs> now, this, most of what I've talked about comes from this, this book, Indigenous Data Sovereignty, which is free. It can be downloaded from that website for free. Um, the, the preface to it was written by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, and it has some really wonderful Māori contributions. I haven't had time today um, to talk about case studies or examples of communities and people who are doing Māori data sovereignty in ways that make sense for them and that are working for them, but there are some really fantastic examples, and they're in the book. Um, there's contributions there from Darren Bishop from Te Puni Kōkuri, who's been an absolute inspiration, and his mahi with Fetu Wereta and devising the Māori Statisticals Framework has really provided a lot of that foundational thinking for Indigenous data sovereignty. There's Māori Hudson and Dickie Farah and their team from Whakatohia who give an example of how they're thinking about data and how that's working for them in a settlement context for Whakatohia. There's one from our colleague James Hudson from the Independent Māori Statutory Board who have developed the measurement framework for Māori wellbeing in Tāmiki Makoto. And there's also some health stuff there from um, our health data warrior, Rawari Jansen from Hauora, talking about how do you put Māori data sovereignty principles into health data. So, so that's that, but um, you know, it's really just a, a humble starting point and there's lots more to be done. Kia ora.